we get a lot of cylinder rods in work like this one here that are bent pretty bad. And for the most part they can be straightened fairly easy. Uh, this one has some uh, other blemishes on it that, and I think there's some dents in here too that uh, just force it to make a whole new rod for this one. But for the most part they can be straightened fairly easy. And uh, in straightening them, we found that, say this is the rod that's bent, um, that if we, when we go to counter bend, only enough to make the rod straight when it leaves the press, that it still leaves a lot of internal stresses inside where the bend was. And so when this gets under a load again, it's going to want to bend back to where it was when it was bent. So uh, we kind of discovered that after uh, we take a rod and we, uh, we go to straighten and we go a little bit too far when we counter bend it. And so we'd have to flip it around and uh, straighten it the other way. And in doing so, we found that it takes a lot less pressure to do that than it did when we uh, tried to straighten the, uh, the original bend. So what we've been doing now is uh, counterbending too far on purpose a little bit and that helps relieve some of the internal stresses or actually probably equalizes the internal stresses in there and then uh, we'll flip it and then and go back the other way again until it's straight and I'll be doing that with the, uh, this Marauder barrel hopefully it'll be a little straighter than that So what I'm going to do is just uh, basically start straightening it. You know the high points here at the bottom, so I'm going to start pushing it over and checking it with the dial indicator. As I head down towards the receiver end. And I might have to pull it out and flip it around and grab it here if it continues to be bent at this point also. But hopefully the bend is just kind of centered in here and maybe when I get here I might have to whack it with a rubber hammer or something to start straightening it, but uh, we'll see as we go along. Okay, so yeah, the high point is there. So I'm going to push it against it a little bit. And the high point is still there, so I'm going to push a little harder. Okay, so I went too far, so now I'm just going to counter bend a little bit again. The problem with this, uh, this medium sized lathe is that it's a lot harder to spin the chuck in neutral. It's a lot heavier gears and probably more oil and stuff it's slashing around in. But that's kind of why I like a little, little lathe. But this one definitely chucks up a little bit straighter and even there. Okay, I think I'll move in a little bit. So that's the high point. Again, the bottom of the barrel. Push straight. Okay, and I went a little too far, which is kind of good. That means it doesn't take much to go back the other way. Okay. So get in some more. The shorter it gets, the harder it is to push.
There's still a high point at the bottom of the barrel. I'm probably going to have to start whacking this with a rubber hammer. Went way too far there. High point is at the top now. It's getting good. Let's see what it is down here. That's good. Okay, I'm going to take it out and see what it looks like. We're definitely getting close, but uh, there's still some more we got to work on there, it looks like. Seems even worse right in here. I think it's better towards the receiver. A little bit is better. So it might be a little bit of an S bend to it. So I'll keep working on it. Alright, so it's been about an hour and a half later. So I'll be thankful I wasn't recording that whole time. Uh, but I think, think I've finally got it close to where I can live with it. Um, it's not perfect, but um, uh, yeah, I basically what I did was I chucked up on the areas that were straight, and I'd have to dial up on them, kind of like what we got going here, real close to the chuck. And then I'd run, the, run it out until it started wobbling, and then uh, find out where the high was and push it away from that. And... Keep working on down the uh, on down the barrel until uh, until I got to where it's uh, it's not that bad. And I had to go up and down the barrel probably about four times, you know, and reverse it, you know, chuck up on the uh, the muzzle end and go down it that way. And but I, it's fairly close. It's uh, when we uh, turn the lathe on here. Um, uh, it's dialed up here pretty close, and then I got it halfway dialed up here at the muzzle. It's kind of finicky down there. Just the weight of itself is kind of sagging that around. Um, but you'll notice that when we go down towards the middle of the barrel, you'll see that it, the, the indicator does move a little bit, and that kind of that kind of shows how uh, steel will work hard when you bend it and and, uh, and try to straighten it there. It, uh, it'll it'll work hard at the bend, and when you try to straighten it, then it tends to want to not straighten at the bend anymore, but on the softer areas around the bend. Um, yeah, so I'm going to turn it on and uh, we'll, we'll show what, it, uh, what kind of straightness we got here. So it's definitely a lot better than it was. And uh, I'll just have to live with what, what I got. Okay, the next step is to uh, reshape that crown. Uh, at least uh, get it concentric with the inside of the barrel. And so I've been uh, dialing up on the, uh, the highs of the rifling, which would actually be the, the smaller area of the barrel. And I figured that'd be the ones that are making the most contact with the pellets, so that's what we should dial up on. But I could be wrong about that. But as you can see, each rifling, when it goes clockwise, that means um, the indicator is being pushed in or out, depending on which way you're looking at it. But 
as you can see when I push my finger on here it goes clockwise so clockwise indicates the uh, the uh, smaller areas of the rifling small diameter of the barrel so that's one there's one there and they're all pretty close to the same mark on the dial indicator and so that's where I'll leave it and lock her down there Okay, I moved the dial indicator to the uh, the crown surface, the old existing crown surface, and um, as you can see, it's almost about five thousandths out there. It's about four and a half, and that's what we're going to try to straighten up. Okay, I got the compound set for uh, 45 degrees. I, it's the chamfer, existing chamfer, is too small to really uh, determine what the angle of it is. Um, I'm just kind of guessing. It looks like about 45. Um, I think the most important thing is just that it's uh, concentric with the inside of the of the barrel. And I got a little little boring bar in here to cut it. And uh, on the, the final cut, I'm going to um, drag it out of the barrel. And that way, it'll help eliminate any um, any burrs, uh, keep those from uh, being formed on the uh, the inside on the rifling in there. So I'll turn her on, and we'll go. Okay, it appeared to clean up pretty good. So I think 45 was pretty close to what the factory had. So that should be good. Quick check here with the dial indicator on that crown. And as expected, hardly any movement at all. So I believe that job was a success. And hopefully 45 degrees is, a, is an acceptable uh, angle on the crown, but uh, it, it looked like it matched pretty close to what the, what the factory was when I was cutting it there. Okay, the next step is we're going to make the outside diameter of the barrel, at least a half of an inch of it, um, concentric with the, uh, the inside diameter and the crown we cut. So I haven't moved it in the chuck yet. It's still in the same spot it was when I cut the crown. But as you can see, the, uh, the, the uh, dial indicator there shows about two thousandths out. So I'll cut that till it cleans. And if it doesn't fit this part anymore, it's not a big deal because we you know, might have noticed in the last video um, that uh, the big, big diameter there of the inside is not 
concentric with the uh, the smaller diameter there where the pellet flies through. So I'm going to be making a new new one of these at, uh, eventually, anyways. So if uh, this don't fit, it's not a big deal. <laughs> Well, the good thing is, the good thing there is that the uh, that piece still fits fairly snug. So if I had to use it, I could could still uh, could still do that. But I'll I'll be making a new one for sure. But I think while it's in here, I'm going to double check that uh, that small hole and make sure that uh, it is uh, need to be replaced because it's. Uh, It'll take a couple hours probably to make that thing by the time you got all the little holes drilled and the O-ring groove cut and all that. So, um, yeah, I'll check that here real quick. Okay, we'll first check the OD that we just turned down. That's looking good. We'll check this guy. That on a small diameter. Make sure it's centered there. Yeah. So that is way off. Let's see. We got five, ten, fifteen, sixteen, like seventeen, seventeen thousandths. That's out around. We're out of concentric with the uh, with the barrel right now. 
So hopefully, when I make a new one of those, um, uh, it'll be a lot better than that. And uh, hopefully, again, it'll, uh, it'll improve the accuracy. Uh, but my dad's got a saying, you can hope in one hand and poop in the other. And I never really took the time to understand what that means, but it's kind of funny anyways, I guess. Well, I went and uh, pulled it out of that chuck without even uh, getting a close-up shot of the, of the finished crown there. And I also forgot to finish the, uh, to at least check the face on there to make sure that's straight. And uh, I just did that now, and it's within about a half a thousand, so I'm going to leave it as is. Uh, but yeah, just a close-up of that crown. Well, unfortunately, the uh, smallest piece of uh, aluminum I have is two and a half inch to make the, uh, well, what Crossman calls the barrel, sh barrel shroud spacer. So I got some hogging out to do.
see if this one's any better. Yeah, maybe maybe a thousandths off at the most. Maybe maybe two. Definitely a lot better than sixteen. The final test for the straightened barrel before I install it in the gun will be to double check the straightness on the uh, glass plate again. And uh, again, the, uh, the receiver end is on the left. You'll notice that it started a lot easier, where before it was uh, rocking back and forth and you kind of had to give it a pretty good push to get it going. It sounds a lot better too, and uh, but you can kind of still hear a little bit of inconsistencies as, as it's rolling down. But I think a lot of that might be some of the machining that's done in the, uh, the receiver and some of the grooves and the transfer port and stuff. It could be actually making the barrel a little bit unbalanced, not, not really bent. And uh, however, if you look down real close, it probably doesn't show on camera, but you can kind of still see some of the irregularities that uh, we saw on the uh, final check there in the lathe. So uh, if you don't have a lathe, uh, this is still a pretty good uh, way to test for the straightness of a barrel. It's definitely a lot better than it was. Okay, I'll get this in the in the gun and we'll do some uh, accuracy testing. With the exception of one, all the following target testing will be done using the JSB Jumbo Heavy. It's the same tin of 18.1 grain pellets that I used during the testing when the barrel was in a bent condition. Now this first 10 shot group will be done at 40 yards. And it's basically just to confirm the sight end of the scope of that yardage. The scope will remain sighted in at 40 yards, even though all the following tests will be done at 60 yards. It will simply allow the pellets to drop somewhat below the point that I'm aiming at, and we can measure the group from there. Later on, we'll compare this target to a similar target made when a barrel was bent. That way we can determine whether the barrel, in such a condition, can cause the location of a group of pellets to change between 40 and 60 yards. Up to this point I've been using the new aluminum shroud spacer I made. Since it's a slip fit onto the end of the barrel, rather than a tap fit like the original plastic shroud spacer, it makes my method of cleaning the barrels a little bit easier. Now, when I remove the shroud to clean the barrel, the aluminum shroud spacer, as well as all the baffles, remain in place inside the shroud, and do so as an assembly as the shroud is being screwed back onto the receiver again. So let's go pop that old plastic spacer back on the end of the barrel and do a back-to-back -back target test with the new aluminum spacer and see what kind of accuracy differences can be found. Okay, we're out at 60 yards. I am now aiming at the upper black circle, and I have the original plastic spacer installed. Uh, after 20 shots of that, I will reinstall the aluminum spacer and aim at the circle about three inches below the upper circle and shoot that for 20 shots.
Now the new aluminum spacer did provide about a quarter inch tighter group in this test. However, the biggest difference was the amount of shift off to the left when using the original plastic spacer. This could explain why I was always having to make a scope adjustment after every time I'd clean the barrel when using the original plastic spacer in the past. This is the first time shooting the Predator polymags in the new barrel in either the bent or straightened condition. With the old original barrel, they shot about average accuracy wise, and it would appear uh, nothing's really changed much in that regard. Even though they're about two grains lighter than the JSB Jumbo Heavies, they're still flying about well, 50 feet per second slower by the time they reach uh, 60 yards. And since they are the most expensive pellet I have, I'm only going to shoot about 10 rounds of these here. Okay, we're back to shooting the JSBs again for our final 60 yard target test. Very calm weather conditions, no wind at all. Uh, I'm not sure how much temperature will affect accuracy, but um, I noted it at 40 degrees Fahrenheit anyways. So uh, let's shoot 20 rounds and see what kind of a tight group we can form this time. So as it turns out, this will be my best recorded 20 shot group so far. Even better than any of the recorded 10 shot groups from the 25 caliber Marauder. It is now time to... Dodges the results. Okay, our first target testing was the... 40 to 60 yard comparison where we tried to determine whether having a bent barrel uh, caused the pellet to go flying off at funny angles uh, between the two yardages. Now we, uh, the testing we did when the barrel was bent, um, all we could tell was that uh, there was a 4 inch drop between 40 and 60 yards um, and that uh, the windage appeared to stay straight in line left to right. And that appears to have been what we're getting now after the barrel work. Still got a four inch drop and uh, left to right appears to still be somewhat in line. It looks like there might be a little little bit of drift off to the right after 60 yards but that could be other uh, things affecting that too. Um, our group size here at 40 yards with uh, after doing the barrel work is 0.750 whereas before it was 0.790 and then uh, moving out to 60 yards we got a inch and a half group 1.5 whereas before it was uh, about 90 thousandths bigger uh, 1.590 with the uh, with the original bent barrel now some of you are probably wondering why I've been maintaining uh, the, the, uh, the side end at 40 yards, even though I've been shooting at uh, 60 yards on all the, uh, the tests after this one. And uh, the reason is because if I keep shooting at the, uh, the point that I'm aiming at, it starts to get chewed up, and it kind of gets hard to, uh, to tell uh, where the original uh, sight was, the original half-inch circle there was. Um, so if I'm allowing the pellets to fall and uh, chew up the paper somewhat below that, then I maintain a fairly good, uh, good clear target there, and it kind of just helps eliminate some of the human error in the in the shooting process there. Now in the testing where we. Uh, try to determine how much of an improvement the uh, the barrel spacer made. Uh, the original plastic spacer, this guy here, got a 1.88 inch group, whereas the new aluminum spacer, which is uh, currently in the gun, 
um, and, and maintained there throughout the rest of the, uh, the video here. Um, it got a 1.680 uh, group, 1.680. So it appears there is a bit of an improvement there in accuracy, um, although uh, it doesn't take much, you know, these are 20-shot groups, so just a couple pellets in that group uh, could have easily turned the tides or uh, at least equalized um, any differences we've seen there. But um, biggest change I've seen is... Uh, uh, this one, you know, we're aiming at this point to get this group and this point to get this group. And as you can see, um, the amount of shift off to the left using the plastic spacer um, was quite a bit different um, windage changed there than what uh, we got using the, uh, the aluminum spacer, where it, which pretty much maintained an inline uh, group there. And that could be the, because... Uh, this being off, uh, what was it, like 16 thousandths or something, that could cause the, uh, the barrel shroud and the whole barrel to possibly just shift over slightly and uh, change the way the, uh, the sight in is. Okay, now the Predator Polymag test uh, was just kind of, a, just kind of an add-on to the, this video here. Um, I didn't do any testing with that pellet, with the uh, the bent, with the barrel in the bent condition, uh, so I really don't have anything to compare that to. But um, the ten shot group we did here got a 2.4 inch group, and I can compare it to uh, what we did with the original barrel, uh, which is about what three videos ago, where I did the uh, the pellet and uh, uh, accuracy testing between the, uh, the 25 and the 22 caliber Marauders. And uh, the 22 caliber Predator, uh, Predator Polymag got a 2.6 inch group average out of one, two, three, out of five uh, 10 shot groups. Now there's one 10 shot group in that test that got a 2.2 inch group, but all the others got uh, well, 2.715, 2.610, uh, 2.645, and 2.880. So. Um, I guess this is more of a test to see if the new barrel is any better than the old barrel. And uh, with at least one test, uh, one 10 shot group here, it appears to be it, it is better uh, for the most part. Um, but I kind of am getting low on those pellets. So, and they're what, like the most expensive pellets we got. So, um, I'll have to do some more testing with those to determine whether the new barrel um, is any better than the, uh, that old original barrel. I was getting horrible groups with uh, several of the pellets there. Now after doing the, uh, the work on the barrel, um, the uh, 20 shot uh, groups at 60 yards seem to have improved also. Um, this is the one we saw in the video here. Um, it got a 1.4 inch group and uh, yeah, the ideal very calm weather conditions. That was, um, I just kind of noted that because um, I was uh, uh, burning some brush outside and I noticed that the smoke was pretty much just head straight up. There was no, no wind at all or e even a slight breeze. So it was about as ideal of conditions as I could have gotten. Um, I, there was another, another group I did here and did not show on a video. Uh, a uh, similar group size at uh, 1.450. Same conditions, very calm, same temperature and all. And compared to uh, when the barrel uh, was bent and uh, with the old barrel shroud spacer, um, we were getting a 1.64 inch group and a very similar second shot or second group of 60, uh, 60 yards, 20 shots. Uh, 1.630. So one point, say 1.635 average compared to uh, 1.425 or something average. Um, it's a pretty, pretty good improvement there after doing all the barrel work. My best group so far, of course, I did not film it, so I can't really prove it. Um, but it was kind of 
in, uh, it was almost getting dark out. It was uh, probably about, I don't know, maybe a half hour after sunset or something like that. And I just was playing around with the gun. Uh, where is it? 60 yards. And I just did a 10 shot group. And um, I was surprised after walking up to the target that uh, it measured about 7 eighths of an inch. Um, now, this is only a 10 shot group, um, so it's you can't really compare it to the 20 shot groups, but um, I was uh, quite impressed with. Uh, is what happened there. Only wish I got that on on film, and but even more so, I kind of wish it uh, would always do that. But um, I think I just cleaned the gun, and again, ideal conditions. Um, is super calm outside, and I don't know if almost being dark had anything to do with it or not. But um, maybe maybe the sun can affect pellets in a way. I, I really don't know, but um, I just figured I'd show that to you. 7 eighths group, 60 yards, so it, it is possible, but just, uh, or at least in my case, it just doesn't happen very often. And then uh, I was reading through the December of 2012 issue of American Rifleman, and on page 72 they did a two-page article on the Air Force Condor. Now, like the uh, Benjamin Marauder, the Air Force Condor is a pre-charged pneumatic. Um, that's about where all the similarities end. As you can see, the stock is actually the air reservoir. And it's got uh, some heavy-duty mounting rails here and possibly some more mounting uh, options up front here for lasers and lights and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's just a totally, totally futuristic-looking uh, gun compared to the Marauder. Now one thing that caught my eye was this uh, adjustable power dial. No doubt that's a huge improvement over what the uh, Marauder has to offer. And the article goes into detail on all that kind of stuff, and uh, I'm not going to discuss it any further. But um, I did, however, notice that over here the action is just a single shot. And I didn't see anything about uh, any mention of any multi-shot repeaters or magazines available, um, either aftermarket or or as an option, but um, if that single shot is all I can do with this gun, that's probably a, probably a big disadvantage for any uh, type of hunting purposes or anything. Uh, but anyways, what I really was interested in is the uh, accuracy results. It looks like they tried two different pellets here, uh, H&N Match and the Beam, uh, the Beam and Kodiak. Um, the, the Kodiak uh, looks like it does the best here at a 0.53 inch group, and I thought that was pretty good um, until I saw that it was only at 25 yards, and um, I thought maybe that was a typo, but they do mention 25 yards here, and down here it's 25 yards, um, a dime size group 25 yards. A little lower than that, they do say that uh, golf balls are fair game out to 50 yards, and um, I think. It's a game that uh, my Marauder could play at least there at 60 yards. But yeah, I was kind of interested in what uh, what 25 yards would be like on a Marauder. The only time I've ever ever shot at 25 yards is probably just to sight the scope in uh, with a new scope or whatever. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm thinking I'll just get a. Uh, Go grab a piece of eight and a half by eleven and uh, draw a donut on it and uh, set it out there 25 yards and uh, see what it does. Um, they're doing a five consecutive uh, five shot groups at 25 yards uh, for that'd be a total of 25 shots. Um, but I'm just going to probably do maybe just one group of 15 or something. See what happens. Yeah, so uh, I'll go get that set up.
Okay, well I typically measure group sizes from the, uh, the centers of the uh, two furthest holes apart um, in the group. And, uh, but with a, uh, with a single hole like this, what I think I'm going to do is just take their smallest group size, which is 0.34, and uh, set my cali calipers to that. And I'll just uh, lay them right here as like so, and uh, I'll just let you uh, make the judgment call on that. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that the Condor that American Rifleman here is doing a review on is actually a 25 caliber version. So if they're measuring their group sizes here uh, by the diameter of the hole that the, uh, the group of pellets has formed, then naturally that, uh, that hole would be about a sixteenth of an inch bigger in diameter than what a 22 caliber version would do. But also keep in mind that they're shooting five shot groups, whereas uh, I'm doing a 15 shot group. And there's your dime size comparison there. Now I better keep that. If by some slim chance that uh, someone who does the, the testing for American Rifleman magazine happens to actually watch this video, you know, maybe consider moving the, uh, the target out to 50 or maybe even 75 yards. You know, let that, let that group open up so we can uh, have something we can actually measure and see what these guns are doing. Uh, save that 25 yard range for the pistols. Well, that just about wraps it up. I was looking at some of the uh, uh, file dates for the original scenes in this video, and they're dated August 5th of 2012. So I guess you can say that this video's been a year in the making. Yeah. Uh, I guess that's why they make the subscribe button to uh, keep track of uh, underachievers like myself. Actually, I've been kind of busy this year. Um, I got a snowmobile trailer that I've been... Oh, it's been taking most of my weekends. I've been working on it and kind of doing some restoration on it and stuff. And I've been taking video clips of that along the way. Whether I make an actual video of that or not, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I've been also fueling up the woodshed this year. And just a bunch of other things. Um, I should have a... Uh, lawnmower racing video uploaded about the same time this one gets uploaded and I do have another pellet testing video it's just an idea right now so I don't hold your breath but um it'll be something kind of different different type of testing video so uh, stay tuned for that looks like they might have a fairly decent sunset tonight and eh, not really but uh, thanks for watching anyways. What the?